Henderson, oh, it's 1 0 Blues! What a header that is! Christian Pedersen with a bullet header! It's then floated towards the back post, Jukovic in there, Jukovic! Oh, what a header! This man is on red hot form at St Andrews at the moment. And it goes again towards the towering Ziggich. Oh, confusion at Martin! And surely scored the winning goal for Birmingham City! Hello and welcome to the first Blues Talk podcast of 2020. Dale Moon and myself, Callum Denning, back with a new edition after a slightly elongated break. Plenty to get into from a very busy, festive period. And a slightly bizarre FA Cup draw. As well as that, we'll be joined by Blues legend and face of Blues TV, Kevin Broadhurst. And Michael Kiftenbell takes on the quick five questions. It's all on the way on Blues Talk. The Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. Right, Dale, we're back. Missed one edition of the podcast over a slightly busy festive period. Love it, though. That's what football's all about. Yeah, it was crazy, wasn't it? Just to get... I forgot what the stats were in terms of how many games it was in how many days. I think it was like nine games in... I'm just looking back at December now. We had Reading Saturday, QPR Wednesday, West Brom Saturday. Yeah. Wish we were sitting here with more points, but don't we all? Wow. That's the only the only downside to what was a hectic, busy schedule. Because all the talk beforehand is obviously this is the sort of period where you, you find out whether you can go and push up the table yeah. and put a good run together or you end up being left behind. Unfortunately, we didn't pick as many points up as, as we'd all hoped, which is a shame. Um, but well, I think you know we'll come on to it, but we hope an FA Cup win, an ugly one, a fortunate one, as some people are calling it, but one that we managed to to get through could be the catalyst for what we hope could kickstart our new year. Slightly strange festive period, wasn't it? Because, I mean, we start, if we kind of go from Boxing Day, we go to Blackburn, it's a game of two penalties, we get a one-all draw, Kareem Morabti coming back to get the equaliser in that one, good to see. Yeah. Um, coldest place in the world. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'll be honest, it's never my favourite place to go. Warmer than last season, though. Yeah, it w- well, that was just absolutely arctic but yeah it was a scrappy horrible away day I think I tweeted saying it was pragmatic from both sides I think Tony Mowbray made made changes we made five or six ourselves in view of what was a crazy ske- schedule I think mm-hmm. both rested players and brought some in and ugly game two penalties you take a point on the road and you get back home I think that was pretty much the long and short of, of the afternoon knowing that we had them a fortnight after as well in yeah. the FA Cup yeah uh, not too much to go into from that game 3-0 defeat at Hull Again, yeah, I personally weren't there, but from all the fallout, it was an, it was a, it's just a bad performance on our part. Some some poor goals to concede. We looked way too open, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it's it's a tough one because you got we've never traditionally done well there. It's been it was a decade. It's since a weird bogey ground, isn't it? Gary O'Connor scored the winner the last time we won there. Yeah, it's a horrible place to go. We never seem to perform well there, but that that was a particularly bad day at the office, I'd say. Especially a shame because it came off the back of such a battling performance here against Albion. Where is we deserve whole, more out the game. It's the whole game, sorry, the one where Jeremy Bear should have a penalty. Yes, in the first half. Yeah, and I know it's I know it's splitting hairs a little bit, but the adage of game goals change games. You look back at it and if if and buts, but we weren't good enough on the day. But if that gets given, it might be a different. Well, Pep's made afternoon. the point as well, of course, talking to the FA in regards to officiating this season. I think we've spoken about it to death almost on this podcast. Just seems sometimes we don't get those decisions that can be. The ones that make or break a match. Did someone admit that? Did someone say to me they admitted the FA admitted that they have we've been on the wrong end of some poor decisions? I think yeah, the way Pep phrased it, it was, was that the it officials was something like yeah they admitted almost we have been on the harsh end of some officiating mm-hmm. this season. But sometimes you have to make your own look, and you can't we can't control you know the standard of officiating. I have my own personal views on it. I seem to tweet about no after every game, but yeah, I bite my tongue. We, we, we've just got to get on. We've got to get on with the performances Absolutely. and making sure that we get back to to what we had been. Let's talk about the Albion game then, because that was a little bit of a bright light in that festive period. Um, Three two defeat. So it's weird to be saying that, but deserved and probably should have taken a bit more from it. Absolutely, I think so. You, you look at um, at the West Brom and the Leeds games. And to the the runaway sides in the division, but West Brom game in particular, you know, you you get yourselves in front early on in the game, a peg back, but it was just a bit of a topsy turvy one. But the performance itself, I think many West Brom fans, we got on with their media team yeah. particularly well, and spoke to a couple of their lads, and and they knew they've got away with one that day. And the the only 
if we're going to have a criticism, is you don't want that to happen too often. We don't yeah. want to keep saying, come May time, how many games did we play well in but didn't get enough points it takes on. me back to the start of last season. We were there for two months going, oh, we should have done better there. Or yeah, that's we were it. Unlucky which is fine, get which the is win. fine on a few occasions, which is fine because it says to you, it says to me that the performances are good. Mm-hmm. And, in, and it, that's where I think uh, managers, when they talk about concentrating on performance, means that 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 should align with getting a result. The better you play, the more chance of winning you have. But you can't keep coming away saying we played really well there, didn't take the points. And I think West Brom was certainly one that goes into the category of deserved more, uh, and they got away with one on the day against a top quality team. Charlie Austin coming off the bench to make an impact. It just highlighted the depth of quality that West Brom have got still in their ranks. I mean, he's a player who only a few seasons ago was being with li- with linked with a, an England call yep. up, has had his fitness issues, and I think even at West Brom with Albion, he hasn't been playing every game up until a few weeks before that fixture. He started to get himself back in, but. I mean, both goals. The first one's just a fantastic turn and finish. It's harsh on Geraldo Bajrami because he actually mm-hmm. done really well that day. It's his first start, being thrown into the, the fire a little bit, but no better place for a young player to, to figure out whether he's good enough or not. And play particularly well, but you only have to give Charlie Austin half a yard and that turn and finish into the top corner. No question marks over the goalkeeper. It's a fantastic finish. And the second one, I mean, for me personally, I enjoyed the second one more from a, from a purist point of view mm. just because... His movement to pull Max one way and dart in front was just at the top quality. And so it's it's gut-wrenching to watch when it goes in against you. But you almost have to hold your hands up and go, we were beaten by, by just a fantastic substitute on the day. From the team, one of the two teams fighting for the top of the championship at the moment, to the other team in the mix where, again, we should have taken more. One of the more bizarre games, I think, that has ever been played at St Andrews. Blues 4, Leeds United 5. Uh, uh, you you leave games like that scratching your head. You cannot apply any logic to that game. We come saying we should have defended better. Well, Leeds should have defended better. We could have scored more goals. Leeds could have scored we got more four. goals. It was the most bizarre. Uh, sometimes you have to just come away from a football match and think, I can't believe what I've just seen. The more people I speak to that are there on the day, with in my emotion, I didn't really know how to feel. Uh, we lost the game, so therefore initially you're like, we've got nothing again to show for our our performance but then you can write thinking we have just been involved in one of the most crazy and but for a little bit of detail later on in the game concentrating on you defending yeah. and making sure you make a tackle when it's there to be won and little bits of detail cost us the game on the day but that could easily have been 5-4 to us just a bizarre game we certainly deserved at least a point from it and uh yeah, I can't apply any of my logic to, to what we saw. Bizarre, wasn't it? The effort shown by our players as well. To come from behind three times in that match, 2-0 down initially. Yeah, just just the, if you you can go through each player. I mean, Jeremy Bayer's involvement comes on. Ailing takes a different line to him yeah. and he ends up scoring. And um, and then he scores a header and then it he sets up Djukovic yeah. with a fantastic cross. And Djukovic scores his first goal with his feet for the season. It was just a crazy game. A last-minute equaliser to make it 4 all, and then... So unlucky for Wes. Yeah, it's uh, it's an awkward one because I think Jefferson Montero should make a challenge out mm-hmm. wide and it just means then I think uh, it's a lovely little bit of footwork that gets Ailing in at the byline. He then, I know it seems like a, only a, a trivial thing, but he takes a touch that wrong... It almost means Harley Dean plants his feet, he takes yep. an, an additional touch towards the byline, which gives him the angle to fire it across. And it's difficult. I mean, Wes is running at full tilt towards his, the middle of his own goal. The ball's being played across... Well, one or two people could say, can he shovel it out away from danger? But it's such a difficult one to defend when you're in that position. So I think the errors were, were, which led to the goal were more influential than Wes's final himself, touch. himself, yeah, absolutely. What a game to end the decade on. Uh, last game of 2019. Uh, and then on to the first of 2020 at home to Wigan. I think we're all of the opinion that disappointing, not where we want to be as a club. No, no, that was a, that a ghost family in the whole whole City Bucks. Yeah. Um, just a poor flat flat performance, wasn't it? It just felt flat. The atmosphere, the players, for whatever reason, a real bit of just a, we struggled to get any momentum mm-hmm. going on the day, um, and we end up, you know, <laughs> the, the side at the bottom of the table hadn't won in thirteen or however many. They record their first away win and do the double over us for the season, which is typical Blues. But we want to get out of that habit quickly. Kareem Morabti again on the score sheet there. And uh, Mags as well, first goal of the season. Yeah, fantastic finish, wasn't it, from Kareem? I mean, a lovely bit of footwork. And that's what he can do if you get him in those positions. I think the thing that Kareem 
I think it's been asked of him is to try and influence games more. Can he score and can he assist? I know, yeah, people say he scored a couple now, but once from the penalty spot. But that goal against Wigan is a sign of what he can do if he if uh, he's given the chance. A fantastic goal from him. And, Max um, sticking his head in. Jack McGowan with a bit of bravery to duck in and yeah, head it from uh, from close range. But yeah, it wasn't enough and we weren't good enough on the day. Well, before we hear from a man who's certainly not going to be short of opinions of uh, Blues games over the past month, uh, FA Cup third round tie here at St Andrews <laughs> Trillian Trophy Stadium. Blackburn again. Yeah, yeah. it's a shame because you want a little bit of magic of the FA Cup whenever it's just an all-championship well, affair. more of that to come. Yeah, yeah. It just feels it just feels like a, a, a league encounter, which, you know, they're reflected in the attendances. But credit to the boys. I'm not saying it was a fantastic performance again by any means, but they found a way to win the game and... I, I tweeted after the game just saying it might just be the catalyst that sparks, disrupts this rut that we Absolutely, found ourselves yeah. in. You know, we've had so many games where we've performed okay and not got anything out of it. This was a game that, you know, if we were okay in stages, I think before the Blackburn goal, although it was it was a penalty and individual error from Ivan Sunjic, that had been coming. They were on top firmly for mm-hmm. a good 15, 20 minutes leading up to that goal. Um, but with 10 men, we dug in again. The Dogs of War, Gary Gardner, Jack Magoma, David Davis, brought Lee Camp back into the yep. side for his experience. Fantastic to see Jake Clark sort of back in. I think that addition there stands us in fantastic stead going into the next few weeks as well because he has been a big miss. And who'd have thought we'd be saying that after the first month, six Absolutely, weeks of the season yeah. where he couldn't get a look in? Actually, the fact that he can fizz a ball into the middle of the park, the fact that he's naturally left footed, which gives us good balance, given whether it's Harley Dean, Mark Roberts, whoever goes alongside him. There's little positives you can pick out from that day. That I'm hope, and it, it may be me being foolishly optimistic, but that feeling that that winning feeling again, uh, with a bit of adversity going down to ten men and still finding a way to win, may just be the little the little catalyst that can can kickstart us. I season. completely agree with you. I think digging in and getting that last minute uh, winner. I was about to say equaliser, last minute winner from Jeremy Baylor when you're up against it as much as we were. Let's not forget, like you said, Blackburn had been on top for that second half as mm. well. That little bit of luck as well from Jeremy, the shot going in. Well, we just sat here now. Yeah, that's it. We've just sat here now and gone through a number of games. West Brom, Leeds, others, others earlier in the season where we haven't got what we deserved. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that we didn't deserve to win the game, but at the same time, it was an ugly, attritional victory. But the victory means we're in the hat. Let's get, get that feel-good factor back in and, and take it into the league campaign. Both sides taking the cup seriously as well, which is always good to see. Blues making a number of changes, but... You can't argue that's not a strong side. Yeah, when the teams came out, we were given the teams. We thought that was strong. It's strong enough that we're going to have a good go and make a good go of it. Sam Gallagher has a couple of chances, and to be fair to him, he just doesn't take. He just doesn't look prolific at the minute. Whether it's a confidence thing, but of course we know what he's he's all about during his time here under Steve Cottrell. Um, fantastic lad, but you know he, he really should have put us away with a couple of his chances. But you know, the longer the game went on, and even though they had the numerical advantage in that second half. They didn't really force too many saves from Campy, the one, the one that he has our hearts in our mouths with, and he scurries back to flick here. But other than that, they kept them at bay, and that was old. That was old-fashioned blues. And uh, you know, I remember when Pep first took over in the summer. He said he didn't want to completely come away from what had made us good over the Absolutely, past few years. Yeah. It was a case of building it and adding to it. And I felt like um, we went back to what the heart of the club is. And even speaking to Jack McGomer after the game, who was on press duty. He said, you know, some of these new players are fantastic for the club and moving forward. He said, but he has all the experience along with David Davis, Camp Gardner, whoever he bought in. They know what it takes to win a game, a championship in county. Yeah, it was an FA Cup, but against the championship yeah, yeah. side. Just that experience and nous, what it takes to win a game, even going down to 10 men. And I thought that typified probably the best way of, of describing that performance. Absolutely invaluable. Well, we'll talk a little bit later on about the Magic of the Cup and the fourth round draw. Slightly bizarre encounter that could be on the way. Home and away. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, it would be remiss of us not to address the club statement put out earlier this week. We'll talk about that later on. But first, a man whose voice, I think, we've all grown accustomed to hearing over the past few years. Yourself, especially on Blues TV. Kevin Broadhurst. Yeah, fantastic guy. I don't know he gets a rap, but he alludes to it on the, uh, he in loves the chat it. with him. But what a um, an insight into the game is a fantastic football knowledge if you have to sit and I've got I've had the, the privilege of sitting through many games with him off air uh, in the Tiblues TV studio and you learn so much watching a game of football sitting next to Kev uh, you can clearly see someone who's played the game at a good level managed the game 
he coaches now, he's part of the community, he's, he's Birmingham City at its very core. And yeah, he might be negative, he might be critical at times. But he's honest. He might be dour with his Yorkshire accent, but <laughs> um, fantastic bloke around the place, gives it as much as he gets as well. And uh, yeah, uh, another one of these interviews that we could have sat for three, four hours because oh, the stories that he comes out with are um, yeah particularly enjoyable. I wouldn't say anyone's been thrown under the bus. It's more that they're driving it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll let Kev tell the stories. The Blues Talk Podcast. Okay, thank you very much for joining us on Blues Talk. This is our official club podcast. I know you're, you've been on Blues TV. You've captained, played, caretaker managed, Done everything. coached, community. But this is the first time on a podcast. Washed up. <laughs> yeah. Done the laundry. T-boy? Swept up. Yeah, I've 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 always be a T-boy. Used to never, be. never be too big to be a T-boy yeah, no, is always right. my no, motto. No. Yeah, <laughs> Good to have you on um, on our podcast. This um, is basically a chance for us to get all of the stories that you couldn't tell when you were a player or a coach. I still can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for the book. <laughs> we'll coax them out. We'll coax them out. Yeah, out, out of you now. So, um, yeah, how did a boy from, from Yorkshire become a Birmingham City legend that's worked himself all the way through the club and now finds himself in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, I played for a team in, in Leeds called Pudsey Juniors um, and they were recognised as one of the best youth teams up there, under under 16 teams. And the guy there got a lot of us into different clubs. One of the people he did know from his time at Leeds was Freddie Goodwin, funnily enough. Um, so Freddie, he spoke to Freddie. Freddie invited me down in school holidays as it was then. It's mm. so different so different to what it is now I came down for a couple of school holidays um, they obviously liked what they saw and kept inviting me back um, and it, it was a funny one because Bradford I'd been at Bradford I'd been at Man City I'd been at Burnley and Bradford had offered me a deal um, and it was a year that the money went up um, from eight pound a week as a first year to 16 and 10 pound as a second year to 20 and Bradford offered me 12 and I went hang on a minute he's 16 the max and they went but out of the 12 you used to have to pay your own digs because you lived at home you actually paid digs I came to Blues Blues offered me the full 16 and pay me digs no no brain I want it I was going to say <laughs> as, a, as a Yorkshireman blues. as a Yorkshireman <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a no brainer so, so I, I came in I did look at it obviously and, and the success of young players at Birmingham was massive mm. you know even back then you Jimmy Calderwoods Trevor Francis Bob Latch all them came through so so it was a thing that's one of the reasons I didn't go to Leeds funnily enough and I never considered Leeds was they were always a buying club in those days they, they had very few come through the system mm. so you wanted to go somewhere where you felt you had an opportunity. Mm. Were you guided by your parents, or did you make that decision yourself to go and? No, I and just made it myself. Really, they left me to it. They were they were pretty good like that. You know, they they always wanted me to do what I wanted to do, mm-hmm. um, and and. You know, I'd come to Birmingham a number of times. It was very different then. You you, you weren't afraid of leaving home. You know, it's uh, we came down here pretty well. 70, 80% of the, the youth team with me all lived away from home. You know, there's very few lads actually from from Birmingham in in the group, so mm. so that helped. Um, and yeah, it was it was my decision and and one that you know has worked out pretty well, I would say. Yeah, was you um, what was you like moving away from home? You've now got the freedom of being away from your parents and stuff as a young young professional footballer, or even just on the books at a football club. Was you a little rogue? Did you enjoy the time away and the freedom? Yeah, or how did I, was, you... I was pretty quiet, really. You know, I was very, very much into football. You know, I was very uh, driven by trying to be successful. You know, I come from a council estate in Leeds, not a lot of money around, four sisters, so I was glad to get out of there, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, the hand-me-downs used to be a problem. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I was glad to get away, and I wanted to, to do something. Um, so um, living in Diggs was quite good. I had when I first got here a, a guy called uh, Daryl Hirons who was here. Never really made it, Daryl, but he had a car, which was always useful because he used to take me to training and back. Um, but but I didn't get involved in in anything else. Our, our, our full focus in those days, we didn't have the the uh, distractions that they have now. So mm. pretty well, you know, you'd up your training. We used to have to do a lot more work because we used to have to go to the ground, do the boots, clean the terraces on days when we'd had a game the day before. So there was much more menial tasks, get the kit ready for all the squads the next day. So as a youth team player, we get the reserve teams 
kit together. We get the first team players kit together. Um, so there's a lot more to it. And then we get the bus home because Daryl was a, a first year pro, so he'd go home after mm. training. I'd go to the ground, get a bus home. Thirty seven, I think it was, to to Solihull or whatever. Um, and that's how it was. So you just focused on your football. We didn't have the outside world really. Do you yeah. think those extra tasks kind of helped you keep focus? In that yeah, area? without a doubt. I don't think it did us any harm. There's a lot more respect. I mean, I had people like Roger Hines, boots to clean, who who was a dour, horrible Scotsman. Uh, Trevor Francis, 18 pair of boots a game, I think he wore. Every 10 <laughs> minutes he must have changed his boots. But there was a lot more respect. You know, as a young player then, you never entered the first team changing room without knocking on the door or invited. And you never spoke to them unless they spoke to you. I mean, it may seem draconian now and all that, but it, it it was a mark of respect. You know, you you have to, you had to, you knew your line in the club, you knew where you stood. Like paying you your dues. Oh, you have to. Yeah, we paid them, uh, and we used to pay them heavily on a Monday because we'd train in the morning, um, we'd do our work, uh, our duties of sweeping the terraces, and. Uh, our bonus and, and privilege of sweeping the terraces was we ran up them. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, how cruel is that? You know, you're not only are you going to sweep them, you're now going to run up them. But it, it was real good grounding, you know, and it, it made us focus and it made us work out. Did you? Did they dig you out? Was you scared of the pros? Oh, absolutely. You got you hit. You, you hit got up, physically yeah. abused. I yeah. mean, I wouldn't like to name names particularly, but I remember getting slapped across the face because <laughs> the boots weren't clean enough. Yeah. You got absolutely battered, yeah. and and you either you either stood up to it and went with it, or you died. And a lot of young players, good young players, couldn't cope with it. Yeah. Um, but it, it it was a tough environment. But on the Saturday, as a young player, you might be playing alongside them. When I broke into the reserves I, I was one of the few who broke into the reserves as a as an apprentice as we were and you're playing alongside you know players who played two three hundred league games international players because on the Saturday you only had 12 players in the first team squad plus one who might travel just in case so all the other guys all the other 50 he now ever many pros we had played in the reserves and we both played on the Saturday mm. we played in the uh, southern um, Reserve League, Villa played in the Northern one, so we'd play Tottenham or Arsenal or Fulham or Crystal Palace alongside senior pros who was grumpy as anything because they're not playing in the first team. And honestly, if you didn't step up to the plate, and you had to be tough, you had to be mentally and physically tough in those days. Yeah, that that was the days where the Reserve League was a proper league. Yeah, I, we I think we come second one year, and, and it was viewed as a major achievement. You know, we came second, and it was really tough. You know, you got these grounds. But again, Again, not just playing alongside internationals and senior pros, you're playing against internationals and senior pros. You know, you're playing against, let's say, you know, Martin Chivers in playing in, in the Tottenham first team. He's playing against us. They didn't have Saturday off if they didn't play in the first team. So you're playing against all these. And I think massively benefited uh, players, hugely benefited us, you know, to play against and alongside some top, top players. Yeah, what we for there's a generation of uh, Blues fans, believe it or not, Kevin, who's never seen you kick a ball. So, for yeah. when you were coming through, what sort of player were you when you're talking around those reserve team days? Just a, I, I was a midfield um, player who, who broke play up. Really, you know, I was never really great. I, I was okay with the ball, but it weren't my strength. My strength was the ability to to win the ball uh, and then give it to people who could play. Mm. Um, and and as long as you get your head round that then you're okay. And and the tendency for a lot of players who are a defensive, destructive players, they then get in the head that can play a bit, you know, and they've got to understand what they do. But I could do a little bit of everything, you know. Um, as a youth team player, if the goalkeeper went off, I went in goal. Mm -hmm. Um in the first team, if in those days, as I say, you only had twelve in your team on a Saturday. So if if the right back went off and I'm playing in midfield, I got a right back, yeah, or I got a centre back, or I got a left midfield. The only place they never thought of putting me, which I think is a bit of a shame, <laughs> was up front. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think they probably knew better than I did at that. Well, yeah. I want to talk about your debut. Speaking of being up front, because you scored on it, didn't you? Yeah, it was a strange one. Um, I only found out about, as they say, you know, a couple of hours before kick off that that you'd actually play. My family knew before I did. Because the club rung my family and said he's playing tomorrow, but don't tell him, and we won't tell him. So I didn't know. Got there, um, Willie Bell included me in the in the starting lineup, which I was quite surprised. Alongside our Kendall, Kenny Burns, and them, and we're playing Norwich. It's a good game, um, and I managed to get a goal. I think I think 
I can't remember exactly, but I think we went 3-1 up, then they got back to 3-2, something like that. But it ended up 3-2. Um, and my goal being the third is, is classed as, as the winner. Over the years, that goal has improved. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, now it has gone from a little bit of a scruffy deflection one. 40-yard wonder it goal. It is now a wonder goal. And uh, there's no video evidence to prove me wrong, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Somebody on YouTube we'll now will find some more. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, we'll find it. Now, it weren't the greatest strike, but it, but all that mattered was it, it went in. And it, anyway, it was a fantastic. I mean, he, the day you debut goals anyway, you don't really... You don't really um, I wouldn't say enjoy the experience, but you don't you don't take it all in because yeah. so much is happening. Uh, but then to have that as a reminder, and it will always be a reminder. You know, it'll never change. Uh, then that's great. And uh, anybody who scores on their on their debut have that. It's it's a brilliant feeling. Did, was that drive probably what set you apart, Kev? That made you go, go on to have a fantastic career at the club and be a captain. Like, there would have been some good young players that you'd have been part of at the, the club. Yeah, the club had some it. some real talent coming through. You know, it, it, we we had a good youth policy. Don Dorman used to go and recruit. Well, as I say, we got them from all over. We had Mark from uh, from uh, London. Mark Dennis who came in a couple of years after me. We had Kevin Dillon from uh, Sunderland. So they weren't just local lads. Julian Dix, who I saw the other week, Dixie came up from Bristol. Martin Cool came in from London so you had lads coming from all over the place really and and you know it, it was good you know the the competition was good the youth league was good then we played against other youth teams and I would say most of them in the Midlands area that five six seven eight of that youth team went on to pro Coventry had an unbelievable team I mean their I think their ratio of their youth team in the time that I played to pro, I think some of like ten of the squad went on to pros. It was it was crackers. You know, everybody was producing players. Villa had Gordon, <clears throat> Gordon, um, Gary Shaw. You know, um, there was Bob Hazel and George Berry and Martin Patchin and all them at Wolves. Uh, Derek Stavem uh, and um, Kevin Summerfield and all those at Albion. It was it was honestly young players getting opportunities mm. uh, and and getting a career out of the game. Yeah, in some ways, do you feel for the young players now? Given oh, without a doubt, how difficult it is. Without a doubt, I mean, it is so difficult. It is so difficult. The competition, and, I, and I'm sure, had we had that competition, then a lot of us wouldn't have got as far as we did. You know, we we would not have played at the levels we did. We may have still done. Division one, division mm. two, maybe. But you look at the players that are coming in, um, and and the opportunities for our young players, and a lot of them now have to go away on loan to just to get any game time whatsoever. Yeah. So it is really difficult for the young players now. Yeah. Uh, take us back to those sort of late seventies, early eighties. What's the culture like at football as a as a footballer, a professional footballer? Oh, we were all dedicated. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. As I came as a sixteen year old dedicated player, by the time I got to <laughs> eighteen twenty, it changed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and it was thank goodness for no mobile phones. Thank goodness for for yeah. um, a lot media. of things, social media, because you know the, the the things we did was was not printable, not not. Um, Repeatable, repeatable, but it was it was it was great times. Yeah. You know, we we went out together, we socialised together. Um, a match day here would consist of the game was like you know three till five, but from five till two the next morning we were all still together. You know, and went uptown, went to different clubs, which we were we were welcome at, and and literally was. But we weren't just the ones. We got town, and as I say, we'd meet the Villa lads, we'd meet the Albion lads, mm. particularly because they were in Birmingham, um, and we'd all go out together it was a real a real culture of, of friendship and and just having a good time basically yeah uh, and we all did it we got in a bit of trouble occasionally um but you know that that was not unusual and it was the same culture at liverpool who who were the the Serial winners the, the winners at the time it was the same at man united who were you know a huge club even then although they didn't win as much in the late 70s so it, it was part of the game then Probably looking back now, we probably did too much of it. You know, we may have had longer and, and more successful careers had we been a little bit more dedicated. But but that was the way the game was really. Yeah, was it the same during the week as well? Would it be because you're usually a midweek club as well? At, as a yeah, if it social. was a midweek game, 
if it was a midweek so game, only after a match would you go out and have a social? It wouldn't well, be a, not 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 only then <laughs> tra- after training occasionally. Yeah. You know, if we had a new lad come to training, the first thing we did after was take him down the booze and see how many he could get down. <laughs> that was a test. That was that was a test. And uh, Billy Wright, let me tell you, <laughs> Billy Wright was a free dayer. <laughs> he yeah. was brilliant, Bill. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Uh, but that's how it was. So, I mean. 48 hours before the game, so Thursday, Friday, no drinking. Mm. Um, although a lot of clubs did, a lot of clubs allowed the, the players to have a couple of beers on a Friday. I remember here, Terry Hibbert, um, Jim Montgomery used to play um, cards for a, cl- a pub on a Friday night, two or three pints, because, and the manager trusted them because that was what they did. Their performances on Saturday were still outstanding. Yeah. You know, if you perform and slip by it, then they would have something to say. I w- we went away um, overnight stays on Friday nights. If somebody wanted a beer, that was allowed. Mm. You know, before a game, you know, there used to be a bottle of whiskey in the um, in the kit bag, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of brandy, and if you wanted a nip before the game, them. you'd have a nip before the game. Yeah, and it became a habit, and pretty well everybody in in the drink. It was like a little bit of a Cheers, let's yeah, do it, let's lads. Go. Yeah, it, it, we go. it was it was none of that, you know, Luke is saying and all that rubbish. <laughs> we were straight in. I'd <laughs> imagine though that fostered team spirit, didn't it though? So you're all willing to put your bodies on the line for each other out on the pitch. Well we were we we, we did have a, a team spirit that I think a lot of people didn't have. Mm. You know, Not and whiskey. I think I think I think that was that was one of the things that helped us a little bit really. Um and I was here, fortunate to be here under two or three managers, two or three different groups of players. You know, under under Jim and uh, the early bit was Mark Dennis and and Kevin, Dylan, uh, Archie, Colin, uh, Frank Worthington, and we had a we had a little bit of a happy go lucky style of of playing and and uh, socialising. And then under Ron, we had Mick Harford, Robert Hopkins, the brutes, yeah. right? oh, brutes, <laughs> brutal. Nobody wanted to play against you. I mean. When your goalkeeper, he's probably the toughest guy in the team. <laughs> and second to him is a centre forward who frightened everybody. You know, then you knew you were in for the battle. Mm. And there was not one in that team that didn't like a bit of a, a, a ruckus, really. You know, from Robert, Howie Gale up top, Big Mick, uh, myself, Byron. You know, all through the team, uh, Billy White, Jim Hagen. We, they, they could row a little bit. So we, we weren't always the best team, but we always give it everything. And if we came off and we lost, you know, at least we'd had a go. Yeah. But it was very different, different, but went out together. I mean, the, the Blakey era, we all went out. The, the Mark era, we all went out. But there were different groups, mm-hmm. different yeah. types on the night out. Yeah, it's crazy to think now how much has changed. And oh, yeah. have to watch what they yeah, eat. Yeah, well, I mean, we had... I mean, I wasn't at the punch up in in the middle of town when you know the taxi drivers had a go at one of the lads and literally kicked off with Blakey, Hoppy, Gailey, and all them. Um, and yet, I've been out with Mark when you know we we got beat by Villa and this Villa fan came up to him and we beat them blues. Obviously, didn't, didn't recognise Mark. <laughs> yeah. We beat them <laughs> blues today. Brilliant result. Next thing, he's on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "What? What did you do, Mark?" Went, Leave it, Kev. Just leave it. Let's go. <laughs> but that was. Did that any was of it. these? Did any of the press get wind of any of this sort no. of thing? Is this just what went on? Yeah. Because there was no yeah, cameras, it, no it journalists. It was all the it? time. You yeah. know, there was constantly things happening. You know, and nights out and and different things. But no, I I think the taxi driver one got a little bit of publicity because it was quite a big one. Now, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it kicked off quite big. Mm. But I mean, lads got into fights in nightclubs, never reported. I, I remember uh, one of the players missing a couple of games because he'd been in a punch-up on a Tuesday night in Bel Air at, um, at Tamworth there. Yeah. Um, but that was that was part of the culture. It weren't like we would do it different, you yeah. know what I mean? It, it, it weren't like we were the most unprofessional team in yeah, the world. Yeah. You talk to Liverpool, as I say, mm-hmm. Man United of the time, they were worse. They were worse, yeah. um, but it it was how it was, and and now I'm sure if we're playing now, we'd we'd adopt the the culture of today, and yeah. we would all you know um, do all the things they do now. The nutrition we never had nutrition at, after the, after training was a bottle of milk off off the groundsman. You know what I mean? And we had to pay for it. <laughs> um, and from there we used to go to the pub. We'd have lunch in the pub, a couple of pints. That was a culture. Um, and, you know, 
we were we were okay. We did we did a reasonable job. Probably didn't do as well as we would all like, but mm. but that's how it was really. Do you think that fear factor helped you whenever you went into games? Did you feel like whenever you went into certain matches, you had the beating of the opposition because it might be a bit soft? And we always we always knew we could give people a game. You know, we always knew we were up. I'm I'm generally did. I mean, we took a couple of bad ones, but you know, so did everybody. You know, on on the day there were some good teams down there, um, and then there were teams that that you struggled with. You know, West Ham. Uh, we usually struggled with uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, but it it, w- it it was always you know we'll have a go. You know Jim Smith was very different to Ron in as much Jim wanted you to go and play, and if we won four three or lost four three, he was that was his style. Ron wanted to grind out one nils. You know they had their different ways. You know Sir Ralph was totally different. He was he was like a different kettle of fish altogether, Sir Ralph, because mm. like we'd never we'd never really experienced how he was because we'd had Willie who was on the uh, Willie Bell who came onto the training ground so every day he was out there coaching uh, and with Sir Alf he wasn't he come out in his suit and his best shoes and the, the mud would be up to his ankles and he'd, he'd just talk to the coach and say I want to do this and I want to do that but he'd never come out in training kit he'd just come out in his in his uh, really? civvies really and he'd be a suit and tie he wouldn't be like jeans or anything um, and he was the most mildly spoken guy you know we could be getting two or three down um, and yeah everything was controlled and measured and calm guys can we can we stick to what we're doing can we just do it a little bit better and then Jim Smith walked in <laughs> you know, Sir Alf went and Jim Smith walked in and suddenly, suddenly it, it was like chalk and cheese and, yeah. and whew, that yeah. was an experience. Yeah. How do you find that, Kevin, when you played under different managers and different styles to adapt? Because obviously here we're going through a changing of style, it seems, ourselves at the, at the football club. How do you find that as a player? It is difficult. To... It is difficult. For some players, they don't suit the style that the manager wants to play and ultimately they go. You know, ultimately, uh, they go. You can be very successful under one manager playing one way and then uh, the other one comes in and wants you to do, because they all want you to do what they want you to do. You know, very few say, right, go and do your own thing. This is what I want you to do. And it's whether you can adapt to what they want you to do, really. Um, And that's why, you know, as soon as uh, Jim left and Ron came, Frank said he was on his way, Mark was on his way, Davey was on his way. So there's about five or six players there. They know, don't they? No, no. no, that they ain't going to suit Ron's style. I actually quite suited Ron's style. Yeah. So I wasn't too badly off, really, because Ron liked that that um, that aggressive, uh, high-tempo... Hard-working... In-your-face style of football. And that's that's why the, the Franks went and the McArthurs came in, the Alan Ainscoes go and the... Um, Robert Hopkins comes in and slowly you see, you know, the players change to to how that manager wants it. And that was a problem really at Blues for a a few years ago is is you had a massive clash. As a player, for me, if I went from uh, Ron's 99, 100, 110% effort all the time into tackles and then you go to gyms where you get on the ball and play. I know where I'd want to be, you know what I mean? But it doesn't always make it successful and it's, it doesn't make you a, a better player because I wouldn't be able to do that. You yeah. know, I wouldn't be able to play. I, I, what I brought to it was, as I say, was that ability to, to win balls both on the ground and in the air. Really strong in the air for my side. So I always get, you know, a lot of balls uh, that way. And, and But then I'd give it to Kevin. I'd give it to Archie. I'd give it to Alan uh, Kirbishly, who then went and... And, and make the things happen. Stuff. Yeah, and I, I'd just be sat there, just, you know, ready to win the ball back for them when they gave it away. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking, did you ever clash with any players or managers? Because you hear now that players are, are different in the sense that they probably won't dig out their fellow teammates as much as they oh, probably used to. Used to. Did you, yeah. do you have any that stick out in your mind? Yeah, where you we had a clash. Oh, we had a clash with our Gale in training. Yeah, me and him almost uh, had it off on a Friday. Friday morning should be a nice, light, Second leisurely season. day. Uh, but we under both Jim and Ron, we used to play a -a five-a-side on a Friday, first to five. Jim was losing, it'd be first to 10. (laughs) Ron was losing, it'd be first to 15. (laughs) Winning goal, two for a header. Changed all the time and it got competitive. And I had the ball once and Howard went right over the top. I mean, it was not... I played here when Howard broke Gary Waddock's leg. And it was one of the worst tackles you could ever imagine. Well, it was a similar tackle in training, but i seen it coming. And from there, that was it then. Yeah. We had to be held apart. Yeah. But that was not 
unusual. You know, there was often little tension in, in training, but it, it never really only twice I think I've I've seen it lead to to other things where two players have had a bit of a scrap. Yeah. Uh, one we had to go on a run, so they were scrapping. See you later. See you later, lads. And we all went for a run and let it happen. So and the, another one was just on the floor, a scuffle. So it it was it was close because co- training was competitive. Yeah. Tra- it weren't like you know we'll we'll take it nice and easy. Training was competitive, um, and and so when you're competitive, you know you're on the edge, uh, and slightly over that edge mm. can lead to injuries. I've seen a number of injuries in training by by players being a little bit overzealous. Yeah. Well, how was your relationship with most your managers? Pretty good. Pretty good, really. Um, I don't think I was a lot of trouble. You know what I mean. So managers that surprised me a little bit. Yeah, I, I weren't a lot of trouble. Um, I, 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 I was fairly level. We had some, we had some proper trouble at the time. You know what I mean with with different, yeah. different. So you uh, might kinds. have been trouble in other teams, but yeah, because but the that, level was that yeah, high here, the level was there. I was, I was not on on the scale of some of them. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. But the managers were were always pretty good. I got on, you know, Willie. I, I got on really well with Will. Um, Sir Ralph weren't there that long, but Sir Ralph, you never got close to Sir Ralph anyway because he was, as I say, even in training, he'd only come out in his in his, yeah. in his suit and then go off. Um, you didn't see him hardly through the week. Um, Jim was the first one who came on, and he was he was as mad as a hat at him and his assistant Norman Bordell. They were brilliant, mm. absolutely brilliant. I was say, you have a wry smile when you talk of Jim Smith, and it's tragic, obviously, that this year. Is the yeah, year his funeral's like next Thursday, I believe, and I, I'm going down to it. But he was great. He was what you saw, what you got. First game in, well, first game we we got beat on the Saturday, I think, and he came in on the Tuesday, and we played Newcastle. First thing he did was drop. Myself and Kevin Dillon from the squad, that was it. You're out of the team. There you go. Not on the bench even. And you think, well, I'm not going to get on with him. You know what I mean? He's not going to be my type. But then within a few weeks, you start to train with him and he sees what you can do. And then you work your way back in. Kevin in particular, I mean, he was great for Jim. Um, so, so you get on with him. So he, he, but everything about Jim was fun. Everything he did, he was so competitive. I remember him and Norman Bordell once having a race, <laughs> and it's like the length of the training ground as it was. So it's length of the pitch. Right, we're ready, and he, he's serious. He's the pair of them are deadly serious. Anyway, he gets past the halfway line, and Norman pulls ahead, and that's it. Now the bald eagle is throwing a wobbler. <laughs> he wants to start again. He slipped on the start. He, oh, is like, no. he just wouldn't let it. He wants a rematch. He wants a rematch. And these two old boys like running down. He used to be. He used to be mad. Yeah. You know the first games. You know he, he invented throwing teacups way before. Sir Alex Ferguson, he did one once. We come in at half time, and them days we used to have a tray of tea. None of them, again, no, no vitamin drinks, none of that. Tray of Just tea, half oh, tray of tea. The tea would go in the air first of all. The tea, the lot would go in the air all over himself. He didn't care, but he'd made a statement. Yeah. One day he picked up a pot of tea, a cup of tea, threw it at the wall. It hit the wall, bounced back, <laughs> hit him. Well, tra- can you imagine? You laugh, can concern? you imagine? You know he's angry. If he had hair, he'd be pulling it out. And he has just done one of the funniest things you've ever seen. And we're all going, who's, yeah, who's going to laugh? Yeah, and we all just... But that's how he was, you know, we... we he loved the testimonial. He loved the charity game. You know, we, we'd have a week off, so we'd play Saturday, Saturday. And midweek, he'd suddenly go, we're off to Bournemouth for three days. Oh, we're off somewhere else for three days. Or we're off to Newport for three days. I've got a friend there who's got a testimonial. <laughs> it's like, Amazing. Who's mad? Yeah. We actually went in one of the winter games. Our, our game was off in... And we went with West Brom to Guernsey. And we just played a game because he was big friends with Big Ron. We just went to Guernsey on a, on a Tuesday, flew there, had a game on the night, had the Wednesday there, flew back Thursday. Him and Big Ron just... So was it a jolly or was it just Yeah, a... just a jolly. <laughs> just a jolly. They arranged. They said, oh, well, it's it's like a training because we couldn't train. Because nobody had indoor training Trains, facilities. Yeah. Nobody had under soil eating. So if the training was off, there was very little you could do, to be honest. Yeah. You know, it was only hard boards in, in um, uh, schools and that, really, or universities. So they decided to go to Guernsey, wherever, Jersey or Guernsey, uh, and put a game on there. <laughs> and we had a good crowd turnout. They paid for everything and had a great... 
crazy. A couple of days with the West Brom boys. Yeah. You know, absolute legends. Yeah. Whenever you hear a, you know, everything that's came out, all the testimonials about him, just being a football man, he was yep. just lived and breathed. Uh, he, he, trips abroad, he, he was legend. Yeah. He was legendary. Yeah. We had one in Portugal and we used to get so much a day if we went away. I think it was about nine, ten quid a day for spending. Because they'd taken us away, it was their trip and everything, so every play, anyway, get there. And Alan Instone and Jim, Alan Instone being the club secretary, said, right, that's it, lads, Portugal. I think we're there for five, six days. Ooh. No money. Ooh. Ooh. No money, no daily money. So they left and we had a meeting, didn't we? We got like, this ain't happening. We're not, we're not, we're not staying here all week and not getting paid. Mm. So we had, a, we had a meeting that everybody who ordered everything signed for it. So we get there on the Friday and uh, the hotel manager comes out, Jim's there, paid the bills, lad, yeah, we've all paid the bills. We didn't have any, actually, gaffer. So he brings Jim's out, doesn't he? There is about 500 chits. <laughs> Jim Smith, Jimmy Smith, Jay Smith, we'd all signed all <laughs> week <laughs> his name. It was brilliant. He went, Alan, pay the bill. And Alan, Insco- <laughs> Alan Instone used to come with a briefcase with all the dough in. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he just went, Alan... Pay the bill and just started laughing, Jim. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> he knew the score. Just it, he took knew the it. Yeah, yeah, the lads just again. But you could do it with him. You yeah. know, he was good as gold. He 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 just he's just such a infectious character. Got in a few states some nights, you yeah. know, and I've been with him when he's been a bit naughty when he's had a few. Yeah. Uh, but he he was top low. Yeah, no, it's great to hear the stories. Um, in terms of the on the pitch stuff, promotion winning side in. In the 1980 season, that's yeah, that, that one, of be- one of the better teams you've been part of. When you look back at the teams that you played for, yeah, we had some. We were always just short of decent teams. You know what I mean? It, it was the it was the typical Birmingham City, really. You know, you just short when, you know, when I joined um, 75, uh, they told Bob Latch, you know, and brought Howard in and Archie. But really, they should have brought Howard in and kept Bob okay. Latch. Yeah, you know Built what I mean? Him. Built on him and add to him. But we always seem to have to sell to bring in. Uh, in my day, we sold Trevor, didn't we? We brought in Archie, uh, Colin and, and Frank. But it would have been nice to keep Trevor and bring them in. Mm. You know, and uh, under under Ron, I think we, we sold David Seaman. Or, we sold somebody to bring in two or three players. And, and that seemed to be the, the theme all the time. So we was always a couple of players short of being a really good side. Um, that The season you're talking about, I got injured early season, actually. I ended up at your old club, Walsall, for a month. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, on the gym, I'd... I'd Got injured, I'd done a cartilage early season, uh, struggled for a little bit of fitness, so he sent me uh, on loan to, to Walsall, awesome. which was great, you know, lovely club. Are you returned um, to? That I, I think fondly of. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had a month there with Alan Buckley, who I knew anyway, because he'd been at Blues with Jim Smith, so Alan was there. Um, and he said, just come in, come and play, get some fitness, uh, which is great. I played the three, three of the games in the month. I couldn't play in the FA Cup because... Blues didn't want me cup tied, so I played uh, Portsmouth. We drew it home to Portsmouth. Won at Peterborough. Won at Bradford, which which was really good. Ken Weldon offered me his car to sign. Oh Ken, you know, oh yeah, Ken, well, yeah. yeah. Um, at the end of the month, come to the end of the month, he said, I, "I want you to stay." I said, "Look, I want to go back to Blues. Give it a go. Yeah. If it don't work, I'd, I'd gladly come and, and speak to you." He said, "Look, you see my car out there, <laughs> beautiful." He said, uh, "You can have it." No, I'm Thank not. You. I'm not staying. You know what I mean. <laughs> I, you, but... I'm gonna go back. And and to be fair, I came back, and within a couple of weeks, I got in at right in. back. It was a, it was a strange one. Terry, I think Terry Lee's had been in at right back, um, and then I had you know limited success. Um, so he he brought me back in right back, and I'd never never been at the club as a right back, and um, I then played every game after that till the end of the season, and we had some some really good. Results mm. won a lot of games away from home with Stevie Linux particularly popping up. Beat Chelsea five one here. Did I tell you about my twenty five uh, yarder? I heard you scored in um, that game again. I think there's video of that one. Uh, so, oh, there is so one it, of that one. Yeah, yeah. so it's a deflected we'll twenty five yard. Okay. Um, and then you know we went to West Ham and won uh, on a Tuesday night. What a great night! I mean, West Ham, one of the most intimidating grounds because at the old Upton Park... They're on top of you, Oh, they're on top of you and they're spitting all over you. You know, it's it's not pleasant. You know what I mean? It was not pleasant. And we've gone there and Birch has got the winner and about 20 minutes before full-time, there's a massive ball. I mean, this is the biggest ball I've been in. Literally every single player on the pitch fighting. Yeah. And in the end, Colin Todd and Billy Bonds got sent off. 
and literally they took the shirts off as they did. It's a good the strap. Same. Yeah. Oh no, it was a yeah. pro- they are two of the toughest guys yeah, you it. could ever. But round it is like Mark Dennis is punching everybody. <laughs> Big David Cross punch me. Um, <laughs> the goalkeepers are involved. That's how bad because normally right. keepers just stay there, don't they? But they got involved, um, and they've took the shirt. And the pair of them are like gladiators yeah. they ri- and they walk off the pitch and strut off and, and it was like wow yeah. you know it was a, a crazy night really Alan Kerbidgely's pu- brother has got a pub about a mile away from Upton Park it's just in the stars isn't it just in the there stars so, so we you ended have up to, you have to we, it. <laughs> it'd have to be done <laughs> so we, we actually left the ground went I mean we always had a beer after the game you know what I mean and straight after the game they'd be There'd be beer available, you know, there'd be a player's lounge in there, two or three pints, onto the bus. There'd be beer on the coach, two or three crates, co- uh, crates, and then back home. Jim Smith decided to go to Alan Kirbyshley's brother's pub <laughs> and have a look. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, past, okay, oh, past two we came out. <laughs> it's it's like, is well, the team bus still waiting for you? This yeah. Time? Oh, the driver's <laughs> Oh, no, the driver's, <laughs> the driver's just staying there. Anyway. We nicked it once. He <laughs> wouldn't get off it. Yeah, we nicked it once. We were in... Uh, we in Bisham Abbey and he, he took us out, we wanted some uh, fish and chips and that. So he took us out and he'd gone in to get the fish and chips, as the driver always did. And we drove off in his bus. <laughs> Who was at the wheel? <laughs> Kevin Dillon. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. And it's great, the story from back then. So yeah, it, it, to be it, was, it was a really good time. As I say, now I look back and think, had I worked a little bit harder. I think up until about 1920, I was very, very focused, very disciplined. And what you get, once you get into the team and once you start earning good dough, you get very blasé about mm. it, really. And we didn't have that that backing behind us, really, to say, look, let's focus. Was there anyone ahead of their time who did do a bit of that? Because obviously that side of the game never came in until much later in yeah, terms of the nutrition, the, the commitment, off the pitch, the rest, the recovery. It was any one, one of your players that you can think of that not many. did? That was the thing. Not many. Archie was really good. Archie was very disciplined. You know, he was very focused. Didn't really come for a beer with us. He'd have two and go. Yeah. He, he made sure he looked after himself, ate the right thing. He, he was probably the most professional of everybody. I mean, we'd go on runs and he'd do it Colin we go on runs and he'd have a walk call he'd have a walk and a jog you know what I mean so so he was like that Frank I don't have to say yeah. Um, yeah. the one thing I would say about Frank though is when we trained he trained properly he didn't do the running like he didn't like the running but if we were doing um uh, games or shape, or he 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 was properly. And after every training session, he'd get a couple of the young players crossing balls for him and finishing. I mean, he really worked out what made him a good player. Yeah. You know, which was that finishing, that ability to hold the ball. He'd get kids firing balls in, and he could take them down anywhere. Frank, I mean, yeah. he was a fantastic talent. Yeah. Uh, but you know, some looked after. Keith Birchin was pretty good at looking after things. But generally, we none of us we, we could all have done better. Let's say, yeah. Uh, moving into your career and sort of when you become one of the senior boys in the dressing room, uh, do you always have an eye on going into coaching management? How did that come about? No, it was, it was a strange one really because I got injured here at uh, St Andrews when I was 24. People forget that, you know. Yeah. People don't say, I retired at 26, 27, 1986. I, I, I got injured, I was 24 and was playing Arsenal here on um, on an Easter game. And we'd I'd been out since the tackle at Villa Park. So everyone, was, everyone remembers yeah. that one and thinks yeah. about that one. Yeah, I got tackled by Steve McMahon and it's a shocking, it's a bad touch, to be fair. The pit, I mean, it's a soaking wet day, the ball's coming flat, I've touched it a little bit far, but he has come so far over the top, it's untrue, you know yeah. what I mean? He, yeah. he, he, I, I, don't I have seen the video of that. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. think it's. Uh, I don't think he's got near the ball nah. uh, and take me out. So I got injured, that was September time, and it took me till March to really get any sort of fitness. Anyway, we get into the Easter period and Ron said, look, we've, we've gone from you know re- reasonably well positioned to, to dropping down, will you mm-hmm. play? I've not played a reserve game. I've not played any real practice match. Rush you back in. So I've come ro- straight back in at Forest on the Saturday. Um, and he's gone, right, will you play against Arsenal? I'll get an injection in it, which we, we did on a regular basis, I'm afraid to say. Mm. So I've got the injection and it's played. And within a minute, there's a 50-50 uh, between myself and a lad called Colin Hill playing for Arsenal, who I later coached Colin when he was at Northampton. Right. Yeah, he didn't it's get any, he, he didn't didn't get get any favours off me. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Colin, you're running today. Uh, why is that, Kev? Um, uh, and we went 50 50. 
and um, we both got carried off. His studs went into my knee. My studs went all down his shin. We both get carried to the um, to the change uh, to the medical room. Uh, the doctor, club doctor, stitches my knee, and then says, "I think you need to go to hospital." So I go to hospital in my kit on my own, Cheers, in please. a caravan, uh, in a caravan, <laughs> in an ambulance on my own. So I go to the um, the accident emergency in Birmingham, hobbling, right, see somebody. And he goes, now, well, we can't do anything with it because it's all stitched up. He said, I'm not going to open the wound up now, so it's all stitched up. Now, I've got to get back to St Andrews. I've got no money, obviously, because I'm still in the blues kit, and I'm on my own. So I get a taxi from outside. There's a taxi there. So I get a taxi, get back to the blues, manage to get out, hobble up the stairs to the secretary's office, and get him to go and pay the taxi. Unbelievable. And I'm on my own. Anyway, I get home on the night. Go to bed, and I can feel my leg getting bigger. Yeah. Get up in the next morning, it's just exploded. Yeah. The uh, the infection and everything. And from there, I had seven operations trying to sort it out. Never got sorted. Anyway, I was only... I stayed. I had two years, two and a bit years left on my contract when I got injured. Um, they didn't really want to pay me up. I didn't really want to be paid up. Um, so for two and a bit years, I was in the treatment room, you know, stuck. And I became club captain then. Instead of yeah. team captain, I was club because yeah. then I looked after everything, you know, if we're having, you know, this or player to put... Fines, fine system? Oh, fines. Yeah, yeah, nothing like now, but fine system. So yeah. I looked after the money and everything else. When I retired then, I was only 27. Never yeah. really thought about coaching, you know what I mean? Never entered my head. My ex-father-in-law had business interests. And I went straight into that, running industrial estates for him, running little leather factories in Warsaw for him and doing different different things for him, really. 1991-ish, Tom Ross, and I, I, I'd known Tom since I was 16, so we'd been friends, he's good as gold to me, Tom. Always looked after me. Anyway, he's, he was running, he wanted to run f former players. Mm -hmm. So he'd started it without me, really, and had, you know quite a few former players plus mates of his who in TV and stuff like that and radio and he said would I come and do it so I got involved with it um, and Terry Cooper came as manager with with Trevor um, and I started then to take over the former players so I organised it I captained it I took the penalties I took the corners <laughs> I made the substitutions yeah. um, so I pretty well took over and from that Terry funny enough could see you that had I had yeah. I had a bit of organisational skills. Yeah. I had even then we don't want to lose. I never want yeah. to even now the former players, I think we've lost about ten games in twenty five years. <laughs> yeah. I mean we don't want to lose. Yeah. We never and we still do it today and we don't want to lose. Um and from that uh, I think it was Tony Taylor who was here doing the youth team. And Tony was leaving. He was going to get a, a, a different job and Terry just out of the blue said, how do you fancy coming in and doing the youth team? I hadn't got a badge, I yeah. hadn't got any experience or nothing, but he must have seen something then that said he'd be quite good with him. him. Yeah. yeah, because he, you know, he's got a way about it, he's organised, he's disciplined, he, he knows what he wants. Mm. And from there, really, I came in, then started to do the badges and everything else and, and got up to speed with it. But that's how I came back to Blues. And then, obviously, he left which was, you know, disappointing for me. And, and Barry came in and, <laughs> and well, he sacked me, you know, within, I think, 15 minutes, he right. sacked me. And then about an hour later, he came back and went, oh, no, I didn't mean to sack you. I meant to sack <laughs> me. <laughs> 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 yeah. He said, no, it weren't you. Oh, it weren't you I sacking. It was Trevor Morgan. He said, you can stay. So I stayed. There's never a Barry Fry story. Well, so yeah, I stayed. Yeah. It was like crazy, you know, and, and, and I stayed really until Trevor came. And then Trevor wanted to bring Brian Eastick in, who was uh, an FA man, really. Yeah. And, and and it was when the academies were starting. And I think he wanted to go to the academy with an experienced person, as opposed to himself, who, who was more about 
day-to-day culture. Grassroots, on the yeah. ground. Yeah, on the ground. Yeah. Didn't want a clipboard, didn't want a, a laptop, didn't yeah. want any of that. I wanted to get on the ground, wanted to work with the kids, wanted to, you know, get yeah. involved in it all. And he wanted somebody who, who, who wanted to do the overall. So that's where it went. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a strange, because I'd never really considered coming back in. And, mm. and literally, I mean, I, I was gobsmacked when Terry rang, f- grateful and thankful because, uh, you know, of uh, the last 25 years, whatever it's been. Just before Barry Fry, you completed the uh, kind of blues bingo card, didn't you? Caretaker manager. Yeah. You know, a captain, me, apprentice. Yeah, we did all that with Trevor, really. Myself and Trevor took over for a a, a game when um, when Terry left. Uh, we went to Notts Forest, funnily enough, and he, he, we'd done okay. You know, we, we played quite well. Um, we'd lost 1-0. I think Stan had scored. Stan Collymore scored a goal. Uh, but we... we, we We'd, we'd done okay, you know, we, the lads could see, you know, there's a bit here, a bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the club had wanted, and the da- David and David wanted Barry, really. And, yeah. and it wouldn't matter if we'd have won 10-0. It wouldn't yeah. have mattered. He was doing Barry coming was in. coming in, and he breezed in. And I wouldn't say the rest is history, but we had <laughs> we <laughs> had fun. How, how long was Barry here? Four uh, years? Well, years we, had a, yeah. we had a fun four years, that's <laughs> all I can say. Yeah, um, unbelievable. Um I want to ask you before we go on to your management career about do you harbour any bitterness about your injuries and the tackles and the everything that happened that led to your no I don't I don't all day I I think that's easily done I think if I did I I'd, I'd be needing a um, a psychiatrist really I yeah. think that's a, a lot of players uh, get depression. Uh, and part of it, I think, is related to what might have been, you know, and you, you can look back and think, if only, if only I hadn't gone for that tackle, if only I'd had another 10 years, because yeah, quite easily I could have had another 10 years, you know, yeah. from 24 to 34. I could beat my head in, you know what yeah. I mean? And I, I you know, I, I don't really look, I, the only thing I look back at is, as we discussed, all the, all the, the things we times. did. Yeah. yeah, and I met some really good people, really good friends, still in keep in touch via the All-Stars and um, Birmingham City Former Players Association. I'm in touch with loads of them, you know, and I speak to them on a regular basis, and I wouldn't have that. Um, so I don't know. I, sp- I see Steve McMahon. We we no problem about it. It's was there ever? Things. No. Do you remember the first no. time we saw him? Yeah, no, no, no. Because I would have done that to him if I'd have been given a chance. Yeah. You know, and it's like a, a really good friend of mine, Ray Ranson, um, who was here, Ray, and he was at Man City. And I, I used to... My family and his family, my wife and 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 Danny and Katie were really cl- close with Ray's family and their daughter, um, and we went on holiday together. Everything, and he he pulled this photo from from an archive somewhere. What a shocking tackle of me on him! Really, and he said it's a good job I could jump. He said because that would have killed me. Uh, and that's how it was. So yeah. you, there was no point, really. You know, there's no point looking at it. Sometimes you think, you know, you see things and think, yeah, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I hadn't have probably been as late as I was then. Or yeah. I, I wish I hadn't have put the elbow there. Uh, but no, generally, I, I think, you know, what went on, went on. Um, yeah. You know, the Battle of 83, whatever it was at Villa Park. I mean, that should be X-rated, really, when I look back at that. Yeah. But, but that's... That was how it was, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't take any pride in that, but, you know. You accepted it for he, what it was. He, he accepted was, it yeah. for what it was. So, no, I don't bear any grudges, really. And I picked up a lot of injuries, you know, f- as much as giving them out, I did pick up. Did you ever you hurt know, anyone else that you remember? Knowingly, knowingly, I don't think so. And I can honestly say that I always went for the ball. Yeah. I always went for the ball. It might have been, in, in my day, you could do what was called a two-footer tackle, right. but it weren't illegal. You know, you could get away with it. They, they later made it illegal. Right. Um, I mean, Paul Henry was a master of it. So two-footer tackles went on. I remember playing at Man City against Asa Hartford, and the ball's there, and I'm going in with Asa for the ball, and he just didn't take any notice of the ball. I've come off, and I've got six stud marks on the inside of each thigh, right into the area that hurts. Yeah. And you're thinking, that's that's shocking. That yeah. you know, he's gone for me because I was I was, as I say, quite an aggressive, quite. I, I must have been a pain in the backside yeah. for the snapping players. dog. It. Yeah, Brian Orland of... used to hate it. He used to come to me before the game and say, "You're not man for man marking me," and I go. Yeah, I am right. <laughs> and he, he goes, oh, please, Kev, no. He said, you're not coming to the toilet with me as well. I said, well, Brian, if it's on the pitch, I am. <laughs> you know, and he was like that. He was brilliant, Brian. Yeah. And he was like that. That was my job. And 
like against Acer, that would be my job. Against Brian Robson, that would be my job. Against Graham Sooners, that would be my job. Yeah, so if they, if they had a playmaker in the middle of the park, my job was to get on top. Ray Wilkins, that was my job. Ray used to be brilliant. I mean, he was such an underrated player, Ray Wilkins. I can't tell you. Yeah. He would take me everywhere I didn't want to go. You'd think of him as a central midfield player. But when he knew somebody was going mad, he'd go left back. And I'd be thinking, I don't want to go to left back. I'm going to stay where they are, where I am. And then he'd get the ball at left back and starts playing passes. And the manager go, where are you? And I don't want to don't go. And then he'd go to right back. And I'm thinking, now that happens a lot more now uh, with midfield players pulling into those yeah, yeah, positions. Yeah, a lot more fluid. But, but, that, but yeah. in them days, it didn't. He used to drive me bonkers. Because yeah, every time the ball changed, I'd look for him. And he was not even close to me. Because yeah. he was not. Whereas Pop, Brian Robson, he was, you knew where Brian, he would have a proper ding dong with you. Brilliant. I used to love playing it. And I used to always, I think, play pretty well against Pop. And he, he was a fantastic player, but he suited me. Yeah. He, he was up and down midfield, there he was in your face. He gave it, he took it, and that was great. What I didn't like was people like Ray who used to drift here and drift there. It was, yeah, it was a nightmare for me, really. Yeah, I bet. Um, moving on to your manager career, we'll, we'll whiz through these. Northampton Town. Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was strange. I, I got a couple of jobs at Northampton. I had a couple of times. Um, I went in originally. Uh, Ian got the sack, and Kevin Wilson and myself took over as joint managers. Um, and I didn't want to be a manager particularly. I wanted to be a coach. So I had an agreement with Kevin that he would look after the managing side. He'd look after the players, and I'd do the coaching. He didn't interfere with me. I didn't interfere with him. Anyway, we got promotion first year. We done really well. We got promotion. Um, and I got the feeling he was trying to get me out. He wanted to bring his own people in. Um, and it got to a point where, hang on a minute, you know, um, this ain't going my way a little bit. Mm. He was perceived as a manager because I'd, I'd accepted the coaching rules, yeah. really. Um, and, you know, we, we'd done really well. But he got me out. In the end, he brought his own man, Russell Slade, in. Um, we'd done really well. I think we're six in... Um, the division in Division One as it is now, um, and he got me out, mm. and it was. But fortunately, we got enough points. So that season, from when I left to the end of the season, they dropped like a stone, but they avoided relegation. Right. Following season, they'd had a disaster, and by October, November, they come to me and said, "Would I take the job?" Um, they rung me. They got beat in the week. They said, "Would you take the job?" And I said, "Yeah, no problem." But he's got to go. Him and his staff have got to go and I'll come. Um, and I went back and we were, I think, eight points adrift, ten points adrift. Uh, and we ended up staying up with two games to go. I mean, the guy's done brilliant. Our run was phenomenal. Did, were you the sort of manager that would go in and make every... The, you always hear about managers who go in to avoid a relegation sort of fight by boosting everyone up, just instilling the confidence back into How did you sort of... Yeah, I just said, look, guys, you know, we this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to be organised, disciplined. Um, to be fair, there was a couple of young players from Sheffield United in there who should never have been in there. There was a young lad from Derby who shouldn't have been in there. Um, and I, I went with more experienced players. Mm. Uh, Gabardini, I got playing. I got Forrester firing. Those two score goals anyway. So I got a little bit of uh, bit of energy going in there. Mm. Uh, we went Portsmouth, I think. Uh, Peterborough, the first... G no, the first game was Brentford at home, Martin Allen's crew, something like that, and we got a point. Um, and we just kicked on from there. We kicked on. Uh, and as I say, you know, we come from nowhere. We were dead and buried. Um, we played it about four games from the end of the season. We went to Bournemouth and we got beat. We had one sent off and they were a good side then. Uh, they played some good football, Bournemouth. Um, and they beat us. And in the changing room after, you could hear them singing that they'd escape relegation. We were going down. They're players. Right. So I've gone <laughs> in and said, guys, we'll get this sword. And we ended up staying up. We lost at uh, we lost at Wigan, but somebody else had got beat and we ended up staying up with a game to go. And the guys went, yeah, we've done it. It was, a, it. it was brilliant. They were brilliant. We played the last game at home against um, Cambridge, drew 3-3, three, three, and that was the season. Went back the following year, and they were selling the club. And that was the biggest problem I had, yeah. was they sold the club. So, got to December, we're 13th in the table. We're doing okay. Um, still one or two players needed. But the change of owners, they wanted us to play like, QPR, mm. you know, they're massive QPR fans. He wanted to sign me Gaza, 
why? <laughs> you know what I mean? And in the end, he wanted Terry Fennick to come in as his manager, basically. And uh, he said, would I be Terry's assistant? I went, look, no, I'm not, no disrespect to him. And he'd give him, oh, we're going to bring lads from um, the West Indies. We're going to bring them in for nothing. We're going to sell them and all this. And the guy, as I say, was a mad QPR fan. Right. Um, and he, he was his hero. He came in, was 13th, and I think they got relegated at the end of the season. Yeah. So it, it doesn't always work out no. bringing new people in, really. No, I was going to say you never like to see a team that you've worked for get relegated, but yeah, there's, there's, no there's ways and means. I mean, in, in, as a manager, you know you're going to get the sack at some time, and I've had the sack a number of times. Mm. Sometimes it's deserved, you know. Sometimes it's not deserved, really. On that one, I don't think that was deserved. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just think it was him having a bit of a flight of fancy fantasy yeah. that they were better than the way he wanted to come scouting with me. We'd we'd won at Barnsley after Christmas, a great win at Barnsley. We'd won two one, I think, at Barnsley, and he wanted the lads to stop off for a beer. I got, hang on a minute, we've got another game in two days. I don't want to stop off. I want to go straight back. We're in tomorrow. We'll get. And he was just, he was just a clown, really. Yeah, you know, much. but he, it cost me dear. Yeah. <laughs> Onto the gas. Love the gas. Love the gas. The yeah. gas was brilliant. Uh, uh, wouldn't Bristol have Rover a word. Yeah. Well, Ian Atkins got the job at Bristol Rovers, uh, but he was still employed. It was, it's, it was one of them jobs that he could get the job at the end of the season. Um, but because Bristol were down the bottom and Oxford were down the bottom then Oxford wouldn't let him go. So he asked me, because I, I knew him from our Northampton days, if I'd go in um, as his eyes and ears in there, as the club wanted to put Russell Osman in on an interim basis, and Ian didn't want that. So I've gone down, same again, I spoke to Russell, I said, look, Russ, no problem, but you look after the players, which is what he wanted to do, you look after the socialising, all the media, mm. and I'll go and work on the training ground. Within a week, we turned it around. The first game, we won 3 0. Within about eight games, we were well clear of relegation. And now Ian could come. Because as soon as we were cleared, Oxford went, Yeah, we'll, we'll forget that bit of his contract. Yeah. He could come. Russell and Ian didn't really get on. So that was always going to be a little bit of a problem. Um, but I got on, with, obviously, with Ian because he'd put me in there. At the end of the season, we'd done really well. Russell left, and the following season it was myself and Ian. Ian was manager, I was his assistant, and we did really well. There was no problems. We missed the playoffs by a couple of points. I think it was a game, somebody, had they, had they lost, had they won, we would have been in the playoffs. You know, and, and the other team went to take a penalty, chipped it, Straight into the keeper's hands. Oh. Otherwise, it'd have got beat and would have made the playoffs. We never lost at home all season, and we got to the semi-final of what the Leyland Daff kind of cup. So we'd done really well, but Ian had had a little bit of issues with them and fallen out with them a little bit. Mm. So we got to the end of the season. They decided then they wanted to play a coach. Ian had brought in Paul Trollop in the season. Now I had Paul at Bristol, and he was great. He was great. I never expected Ian to sign him because I wouldn't have thought he was Ian's type. Talking to model professionals, he was the most model professional I've ever worked with, Paul. Right. And he was brilliant. Following season, they wanted to change it and have a player coach. So they said to me, I was the link between the players and Ian because Ian didn't really get yeah. on that well with the players. And he didn't have to. Yeah. That was my job. Yeah. But they wanted a, a player coach so they'd have one wage. Uh, rather than the two and so I went and they were brilliant you know I've been at a lot of clubs where you know when you get paid off it's over the length of your contract they mm -hmm. just give me a check they were embarrassed really yeah. uh, I met the uh, vice chairman whatever he was in Solihull and they paid me everything Fair even point. stuff I didn't I probably shouldn't have had yeah. and they would and I never have a bad word say about them yeah. other clubs try and rip you off basically try and yeah. pay half your contract they were good as gold Bristol Rovers though yeah uh, it could very well be our opponents in the next round. Yeah, great. I always love going back to the gas. Some <laughs> yeah. of the people are saying, proper old-style football club. Yeah. I love the ground. It's still got the yeah. clock and the... They're you know, in pre-season. The yeah, the yeah, 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 it was Brilliant. great. Above the... Uh, ab I used like to go the in the stand, yeah. main stand in the in the gantry there. Right. Oh, that ladder. Oh, yeah. The back. Hackers used to go on the touchline and get pelters. I used to go up there. And <laughs> hide up there. Yeah, yeah, used to hide. Above. yeah, I used to go up there. And then one game, he went, you go in the dugout. I'll go up there. <laughs> <laughs> no way, mate. I'm staying up there. So. Uh, finally, I think I know what's coming here. A 61-day stint as manager at Warsaw. Yeah, that was a strange.
strange one, really, because it's it's the most local club. As I say, I had a month there. Uh, things weren't right. I took over from Paul Merson. There was a lot of issues. We had a really good start, a really good start. We went to South End, who were flying and drew. We went to um, Swansea. We drew at Swansea. We won nil up in the... It was one of them stupid ones. We won nil up in the 90th minute. Uh, the lad goes through... Put it anywhere. Basically, put it anywhere. Score, preferably. Yeah. But put it in the stand <laughs> if don't you don't mind. Keeper, yeah. Don't give it to the keeper who launches it and they equalise. 1-1. One, one. Unlucky. Yeah. We've got a tram here on a Friday night, which is notoriously difficult. You know, it's it's a really tough place on a Friday. And we win. We haven't played at home yet. And that was the worry. They'd not won at home for about six months. And you could see why. Um, which, which was a little bit frustrating, really. Um... The team wasn't what you'd like. Um, one or two characters there that I would have to question, mm. if I'm honest. Like pulling out of games when they had no reason to pull out of games. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have any luck. We, as a manager, be good, but even better than that, be lucky. Be lucky. Yeah. And we didn't have a look. I remember playing Port Vale. We won nil up against Port Vale. Um, the ball goes over the top. Danny Fox is clearing it. Hits their their wide player in the chest bounced to the centre forward who's 15 yards offside gives a goal you think hang on a minute where's the he flag went, he sliced it what do you mean he sliced it he said he sliced it backwards <laughs> I went no he sits <laughs> him, he sits him in the chest and gone back I went nah I'm not having that anyway I'll come and see you after the game went to see him he'd gone referee had gone <laughs> <laughs> he's back and left he it and were on the same game. So it's it's 1-1 one, one now, last minute. Ball goes forward, big eye ball forward. And Andrew Barrowman's in the box. And he's got two defenders and the keeper all coming. He stands still. All three of them run into each other and fall down. And he rolls it into an empty net. Free kick. He's not <laughs> jumped. He's not. In fact, I was quite angry he hadn't jumped. So... You get things, and it's not to be. You know, some yeah. places it's not to be. I mean, we did it at Northampton. We'd done it at Bristol. Um, we weren't a million miles away from doing it at Walsall, to be fair. And had we had a little bit of luck, mm. you know, a little bit. I got a couple of players injured at the wrong time, a couple of midfield players who got injured at the wrong time. Uh, when we were doing it, we were actually doing really well. And that, that affected us quite a bit. But, you know... Sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't, doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. And then, just to wrap up very quickly, now find yourselves back working at the football club, part of the community programme. Tell us a bit about what you do now. Yeah, I just, I mean, community department here has been pretty good from when Dean had it, Dean Holtham had it years ago um, through to now. And whenever I got a job in football, I say goodbye. And whenever I get, whenever I get sacked, I say hello. And they're pretty good to me. You know, they... they they always look after me. And, and if they can give me something to work, they give me something. The last couple of years... I've 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 really got away from wanting to get back in the pro side. I'm like 60 now, so I've got grandson in London. So it's not it's not everything, you know. I want a little bit of family time. Next grandson's due next month. Um, so I thought, well, I'm gonna for a couple of years, two or three years now. I'm just if you want me for two or three years, I'll agree to two or three years, which is what I've done. We run a 16 to 19 age uh, football education program where they do uh, education four days a week and football. Um, Keeps kids who probably wouldn't be in education in education. Um, you know, we, we run out of the training ground. We play at the training ground. We play other league clubs. So on Wednesday, for instance, we're playing West Brom. Next week, we play Wolves. The week after, we play uh, Burton Albion. So And it keeps me involved. It's it's pretty well part-time. So I can, I, I've got time off. Uh, and it suits me. And I really, really just enjoy being out there. Although some days you you wish you weren't <laughs> out there, uh, but that's what I do. I still do a bit with you guys. Yeah. Still en Sorry about enjoy that. that, but uh, yeah, I get pelters for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's social media. That is. social media has right. a lot. I'm, I got pelters the other day. I wasn't even at the game. <laughs> oh, you told me about that. Oh, oh, you're I'm getting. I'm getting. Hang on a minute. I'm not even there. You know. <laughs> um, but you know, you try and be honest, don't you? you try as, as as a commentator and as a pundit, you try and be honest. Before about you know season in general, but on that game you can only you can only comment can, yeah. on what that game yeah. is, and if that game's great, and we've had some, we got know. some uh, Brentford, Brentford away. I remember we, me and you commentated on that one, the five-one defeat. 
Uh, what can afterwards, you, what can can, you say? Afterwards, we got I mean, in a post. this season, we've had some really good middles. were outstanding. You couldn't say anything, and we've nicked it in the last minute, although yeah. we should have been four or five clear. Mm. You know, we've had some really good performances. But you say something, and suddenly you're like, oh, always negative, always against the club. <laughs> I've been here. I'm not being here. I've been here since <laughs> 1975. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, hang on a minute. You know, if I didn't love the club and want it to do well, I wouldn't be here now. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, let's hope it continues. But, you know, it don't always go well. And, yeah. and you've got to be allowed if it don't go well. Like, and if it's like kids, you know, if they do things, you can't tell them that's wrong. Yeah. You, be? you know, and I think that's part of what's wrong. You know, there's 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 no discipline to it all now. You know, uh, my kids, if I say, don't do it. Oh, don't shout at me. Don't, I'm not. I'm saying don't do that. You yeah. know, yeah. it's not shouting at you. It's I'm just, just advising you not to do it. And everybody thinks because because you're saying don't, it's negative. Yeah. Not always negative. Yeah. I've got one more question for you actually before we go. Kevin Dillon spoke to the guys who do the program about his all-time eleven. Yeah. You made the bench. Where's well, going well, yours? Let's well, twist it on him. He he don't even get in mine. <laughs> <laughs> I made the bench. You made the bench. Who's in your all-time eleven? Yeah, uh, he 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 would be in it. Well, I don't know. It's, there's a lot of good players there. There are some unbelievably talented players. I mean, different sides, as I say, under, under Jim Smith, Mark, David Langen, outstanding. Yeah. Mark, outstanding. Colin, outstanding. You know, we had, we've had some brilliant. Do you pick Frank? Do you pick uh, Trevor? You've you know, got too Do you many pick to Mick from, haven't you? When you've been here as long as as I have, then you do, yeah. I'm I, I'm actually glad to get on anybody's bench, if I'm honest, because there were so many good players. And I have to say, I have what what a lot of them, in, in the in the programme that, you know, when you get your little bit about yeah. you, it's stocky. Always well. have a look at that, stocky. Okay. <laughs> Not flattering. <laughs> Utility. Oh, could yeah. do a bit. Yeah, yeah could do a bit. Anywhere. So, so that, that's kind of yeah. fat. No man's land, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. Fat, yeah, I yeah. Ain't got, fat and I ain't got a position, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's how it was, you know, and, uh, you know, stock is a bit hard. Um, but, so I wasn't, in my seasons here, out of the years I had, I had a couple of seasons centre-half, season at right back, two or three seasons in midfield. So, really, so, but when you come against technicians like Archie, a midfield player, like Kerb's a midfield yeah. player, you know, you, you, you're against players who, who their careers was that yeah. you know mine never was in my day I was successful because I was a utility player because I could do you know if if we needed a full back I played left back against Man United here one day um, you know what I mean it was like we haven't got a left back Broads will do it you know what I mean we haven't got this Broads will do it you know what I mean? we haven't got a sub Broads will do it on, broads. You know, we haven't got a, somebody to carry the bucket Broads will do it we ain't got a commentator on Blues TV Broads will do it, <laughs> and that's how it is. But, <laughs> but you don't get upset by it. You don't. I'm I'm actually delighted. I made I made anything with Dill. All time, 11. yeah, Not because bad. because Dill's Dill's a funny a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> Kev, I'm sure we could do about three hours here, but uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us. No, it's I've always a, a great privilege laugh. with you guys. Yeah, good laugh listening to it. So I appreciate the it. Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. What a man, Kevin Broadhurst. Yeah. He's got some great stories and it comes through, he's a player who obviously came from a time where football was a little bit looser in terms of you, what he was asked of you and your commitment. And Same as what Spoons was saying though, Steve Spooner. Yeah, yeah, that it's just a generation of, and like he said, it wasn't just Blues. I mean, that particular team, the, the original Crazy Gang or whatever they were referred to as, uh, weren't alone in, in their antics off the pitch. And I, as a football fan, I mean, forget that, you know, we're at the club. As a football fan, I love to hear those stories about what football used to be like and the players and what they get up to away from, you know, 90 minutes on a Saturday. And uh, I think he'd had fantastic fun. A, a crying shame that his career was cut short with those injuries. But as you say, there's no remorse and, and bitterness with what's happened. With what happened. happened. Yeah, and he had a fantastic career. Still involved in the club. I, and I, as I say, I personally love having having him on Blues TV. I love the idea of the nutrition in the 80s. Just, I mean, you hear... Shot of whiskey. <laughs> yeah, but in the changing room before you go out. But you hear, like, pretty much steaks at clubs. Unreal. Uh, because... Well, there just wasn't that knowledge and understanding. And I also think the game moved to a professional level. I know it was professional football, but the professionalism of the match, yeah. of the, the sport, sorry. More uh, athletic. Yeah, just you know the data involved when the technology started to emerge. That meant there's no hiding place for players anymore. You know, now we're seeing you know players running on a treadmill, having pinpricks on their fingertips to get blood from them every 10 minutes. I mean, physically, you can't hide whether you've 
not been eating what you should have been eating or you are pushed to the limit yeah, as so well no matter if you've been eating clean or not yeah so it's uh that's very different to the time that kev was playing but some great stories from kev spoke fondly spoke fondly rather i can't get my words out spoke fondly about his memories at the gas bristol rovers who could of course be our opponents in the uh, fourth round of the fa cup i mean who didn't see that one come in i think when the, the, on, the two it? teams were still coventry and bristol bristol rovers sorry were still in the hat and so too uh, were ourselves uh, <laughs> I think supporters just thought it'd be so blues for it to happen and yeah I mean we're still trying to get to groups with what would happen if Coventry City did actually right. get through that tie so we're speaking on the Tuesday of this week podcasts will go out on the Friday I don't know if anything will have been agreed by then or what but the logistics of it I, I mean I'm glad that you know in our roles we don't have anything who gets to do the manager's office it. who goes in the away changing room does who gets the home end <laughs> Uh, so yeah, as I sit here now, I don't, I cannot confirm what would happen if Coventry City do beat Bristol Rovers. Um, but so typical that that fixture is thrown up given the ground share. You know what I'm looking forward to if it does happen and we end up playing Carve. Have you ever seen the clip of when Ron Atkinson became Forest manager and he went and sat in the wrong dugout? <laughs> One of Mark Robbins or Pep Clotet is getting to that home dugout first. Yeah, and they're just claiming it like an arms race. <laughs> Yeah, to try and claim, and his backroom staff, to try and claim the home dugout. We'll, we'll be Which weird. Which after we warm up in? Yeah, it'll throw, what happens at a replay? Who gets yeah, what pubs? It, it, throws up, it throws up so many of these little quirky scenarios. But uh, ultimately, what it does do is give Blues a chance. And you don't, you don't take anyone lightly in the club, but it gives Blues a, a really good chance mm. now to progress into what would be a fifth round tie. So get Bristol Rovers or, or Coventry City, uh, regardless of who they are. Blues will fancy their chances. It's been a couple of years as well since we've progressed past the fourth round. So, of course, fans, you and I, um, of course, the staff, the players, all looking at a fantastic opportunity. You talk about stopping the rut. Cup run will be just the thing. Yeah, just momentum, just that winning feeling again. And it also gives minutes, competitive minutes to players in the squad. We have a big squad of experienced players. You know, We're not talking about young players that are getting thrown in when needed. We have an experienced, in-depth sort of squad. So... These additional fixtures, especially in January, you've, we've only got Saturday games throughout this month. So um, there will be players that need game time. It, as we saw, Pep can make the changes and still include the likes of David Davis, Jack Magoma, Jefferson Montero, Dan Crowley coming in and getting minutes, which is he needs following his injury. So, uh, But more importantly than that, the FA Cup just lifts everybody. If you can get a good tie in the next round, if we do get past Coventry and or Bristol Rovers, it just might lift everyone and yeah, get, create a bit of that feel-good optimism again. Well, one man who you can't help but kind of pick up a feel-good optimism factor from, Michael Kiftenbaud, of course, being absent since April of last season after suffering that injury against Leeds. Good to see he's well and truly on the mend. More of that to come on Blues TV, of course. But you took the opportunity, Dale, to have a chat with him. Yeah, fantastic guy, isn't he, Michael Kiftenbeld? And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's one of the smiliest faces around the place. There's that cheeky chappy bit about him. And he's remained optimistic throughout the, the last nine months or so. A horrible injury. I think everyone knew at the time when he, when Keith stretched it off, you know it's serious. But, uh, yeah, some quick little answers from uh, from Quickfire Keith. The Blues Talk Podcast. Um, what music would you choose to listen to to get you up for a game? Pool will be... Something like techno, like there's a festival called Tomorrowland, and I listen to that, makes quite a lot. Um, which country, in your opinion, produces the best food? Which country? Wow. Italians. It is good. Have you got a middle name? Nope. Nice and easy. Ideal holiday destination? Um, Spain. I would say Spain, but I love to see. Some, I've been there many times, so I'd love to see some uh, different countries in the next few years. Yeah. Uh, have you got a favourite TV series of all time? Um, I enjoyed Prison Break, and I really enjoyed Entourage. Prison Break was the original TV series that just came out online that has got everyone hooked. Uh, what do you order from a coffee shop? I know you're a coffee fan, so what's your order? Most of the time, a flat white. Oh, nice to see you. I thought you'd be like caramel macchiato oh, with just... pumpkin spice. No, in Holland, we, uh, normally we don't even put milk in our coffee or in our tea. So it's more black Americano, but I prefer a bit of milk. Nice. Um, okay, this might take time to think about, but what's the best goal you've seen whilst you've been on the pitch? 
So it can't be one of your goals, but you've got to have been on the pitch when it was scored. It can be in Holland, it can be here, it can be when you were a kid. Any level of football, but it's got to have been the best goal you remember seeing from on the pitch. Well, I need some time for that. Um, probably what wasn't it, but when we scored... Um, Nah, I know what you mean. It's the best goal. For yeah, me, the best, still, the best goal was in the cup final yeah. when we scored the 1-0. That feeling was the best feeling after a goal I ever had. Yeah. So, maybe up. it wasn't a pretty goal, but still, the feeling around it was Absolutely. Um, Did you have any posters on your wall growing up? Um, yeah, we had a magazine, a football magazine, and always in the middle was a poster of, the, of a player, and I used to put them... In my uh, bedroom. Yeah. Did you have an English team you supported growing up, or did you just have a Dutch team, or did you not have a team that you supported? No, not really. My, f- my father supported Ajax because they were doing really well mid nineties. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I grew up with Ajax, but no, I never supported really a team in England. Have you got um, a sporting hero, someone you'd like to meet, who's a an athlete? It can be we've had Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali. No, not not really one person in particular, but a lot of got a lot of respect for um, for um, sp- how do you say athletes who are not top for a long time. Yeah. If you watch like Roger Federer, I would love to meet him. Yeah, I saw him on Ibiza uh, yeah. one day, and I w- didn't ask him for a photo, and I still regret it. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, when you go to get your hair cut, what instruction do you tell the barber? So what do you tell him to do to your hair? Just usual, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen him that often. He knows what to do with your hair. Uh, what's your favourite cheat meal? So if you're going to eat a dirty meal, a bad meal for you, what's your favourite? A uh, burger with some fries. Uh, can you speak any other language other than Dutch and English? No. Which Hollywood actor would you choose to play yourself in a Hollywood movie? Which Hollywood actor? So if there was to uh, make a movie called The Michael Kiftenbeld Story, who plays Michael Kiftenbeld? Um, I think there's a bit of Leonardo in there, mate. <laughs> no, I don't know, mate. There's a bit of Leonardo DiCaprio, I think. Brad Pitt, yeah, Leonardo. Brad Pitt, yeah, the world, that's a good mix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're better looking than you, mate. Uh, if the whole squad had a, like a fight in the ring, who would be left at the end? If the whole squad? Probably... Duke is quite big. Robo is a big guy. Dig is a bit smaller, but it's pretty strong. Okay. Uh, but in the end, I will win, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many players say that, yeah. Um, what's the best pair of trainers or boots you've ever owned? So it can be from years ago, or it can be current ones, but the best pair of boots or trainers that you remember thinking, uh, yeah, that were my favourite. I think it were, I was like 15 years old, and were Nike Vapor. Yeah, yeah, Vapor. I love them, yeah, man. Yeah, I treat them better than anyone. Yeah, they were very good. Uh, what do you have on your pizza? Um, a lot of meat and onions, peppers, some ham. Um, what type of student were you at school? Um, pretty good in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mind study, but when I became a bit older and football were a bit more intense and I... Um, yeah, I dropped my school ambition a little bit and you could see that in the results, but in the end I, I passed my exam and that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, the strangest food you've eaten, whether you've gone abroad and tried something different? Have you ever tried any strange foods? No, I'm not really, I don't really like to uh, eat different food. Mm-hmm. Also, when I go to a restaurant, most of the time I order just things I like, yeah. just to be sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. Uh, what's on your bucket list? So is there anything you want to do before you die? So some have said jumping out of a plane, other well, people, yeah? I've not, I jumped out of the plane. I tried to um, do diving as well, but I'd love to be 100 metres up in the air, but put me one metre down the water and, uh, yeah. I'll really? Freak I'll out? Freak out, yeah. yeah. I didn't like it, so never again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my bucket list is um, just to see a lot of the world. Yeah, travel. Maybe, maybe um, go to um, where you can go behind the uh, wolves on a oh on, on a, a sleigh, uh, yeah. like a, like the North Pole and exactly that would be a husky, a husky, husky thing. Yeah, exactly, and safari. Oh yeah, safari sounds amazing. Um, what's the worst item of clothing 
you've ever worn. So when you look back now and say, what was I thinking? Mm. And don't say you don't wear bad clothes because everyone has always has had bad clothes at some stage yeah. in their life. Uh, oh, I, w- I remember when I was young, it was everybody was wearing it. It was a bit of a um, skater. Oh like yeah, yeah. Really baggy, baggy jeans. jeans and baggy. With a chain on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> with the with the really weird pictures on the front and uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. I need to find a picture of that yeah. so we can put that out. Um, are you addicted to anything? Um, no, I don't think so. I think I was addicted a couple of years ago to cola, really bad. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, never thought I was addicted until I stopped with it and started drinking water. So I've been shaking for two months and then. Like, <laughs> yeah. Really? With yeah, it was really symptoms. Bad. Yeah, wow. when I was young, I was used to drink coke. What are you most afraid of? Uh, people who pass away. Yeah. Yep. That's a common, common answer. Um, favorite city in the world other than your hometown and Birmingham? Um, I really like Barcelona. And I've been to Rome this this year with my missus, and I really enjoyed that city as well. Okay, this is the most important question of the lot. When you eat chicken, what part of the chicken is your favourite part? So, like, is it the breast, the thigh, the wing, the leg, and how is it flavoured? Um, the wing. Okay. With, um, how do you call it? What, like hot sauce? Yeah. Bit like of a spicy sauce. sauce. Yeah, spicy sauce. Good. And the outside has to be crispy. Uh, crispy. Yeah. Very specific answer, though. Uh, what are your thoughts on people who fish, who go fishing, and use their time to sit there for hours and go I, fishing? I used to do it with my granddad. Yeah. Until he passed away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no, but the uh, yeah, I, I like to fish in, but once I catch a fish, I didn't like to take it off. So he had to take it off. <laughs> so you catch it, yeah. like wriggling around. Yeah. And that's no, and then you had to take it off. <laughs> um, have you got any sporting memorabilia? So any shirts you've changed or anything you collected from yeah. your sporting days? Yeah, not from... Um, just from my mates in the in the team. So I got it from Groningen, from Goed. A couple of um, friends I play against. Yeah. Last question. Have you ever read a book from cover to cover, front to back, and what book? Have you ever? Yes, of course I have. No, you'd be amazed how many players have never read a book cover to cover. So that's, you need to, yeah. You're part of a book club. Is it you, Morrow, Juki, <laughs> book club, mate? I'm, I won't say I'm part of the book club. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when I'm on a holiday, I love to read a book because then I feel I've got time for it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I've got a lot of time, but yeah. now I don't. Um, yeah, it's all about... Most of them are um, based on a true story, um, biography, yeah. about most of the time um, an athlete. Yeah. Just the way that like, the one I read before was about Nadal. Yeah. And yeah, the way he looks at his sport and motivates himself. Quite interesting. The Blues Talk Podcast. Michael Kiftevald, his second podcast appearance now. I oh, know, yeah, he loves it, don't he, really? He did, his, uh, he did a Q&A, didn't he, one of the suites? He actually don't mind his... Um yeah, good guy. Very much a Brummy now at heart, isn't he? Uh, Keith loves the city. See him well, out and about. Christmas actually. filming uh, on our bloopers video. He couldn't remember how to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in Dutch. He's been here that long. <laughs> yeah, that's it. He's uh, very much part of the furniture here at the club and good to see him on the mend and hopefully be back in action soon. All right, on to more serious matters. Um, more, It would be remiss of us rather to not address the fact that earlier this week the club were charged by the EFL just to read the statement. Uh, The club, Birmingham City, confirms that it has been charged with a breach of EFL regulations in relation to a business plan imposed upon us in the 2018-19 season. The club denies the charge and we await the outcome of ongoing disciplinary proceedings. We shall be making no further comment at this time. Yeah, tough for us really to to comment on this one just because we're not um, privy to the detail. But, you know, the statement went out. I think it's in response to a national publication. Mm -hmm. Um that was published on the late late on Monday evening. Um, but yes, <laughs> whenever you hear FFP and stuff, you just sort of groan. And we've been here before, haven't we? So the only hope is that at a time where we need some results and performances, this doesn't serve as a distraction because once it's hanging over the players, especially the ones that have been here before mm-hmm. throughout the, the, you know, the points deduction and stuff um, the first time around, hopefully uh, the club can get it resolved. You know, those higher than me and you, Cal, uh, can get it resolved and it doesn't lead to to any impact on the pitch. So until 
we hear any further details, I suppose it's a case of keeping your eyes on bcfc.com, um, listening for it to, and, and looking out for any official word from the club. Well, on to a lighter topic. 23 is a great result earlier in the week. Yeah, really good uh, away. I mean, there were five points off the top, but they've been really good this season, the 23. Steve Spooner, uh, Jabby Khan's increasing involvement in the first team means that really Steve Spooner's at the helm of that 23 side now. Um, ably assisted by Stuart England last night. Christian Speakman also goes along to the odd game too. Um, yeah, really good. 2-1 uh, victory at uh, in Chesterfield against Sheffield United who always give us a good game but we were a good value for it just a defensive mix up uh, gave Sheffield United the lead it's great to see Zach Jaycock back out on the pitch as well three months out following a fractured wrist for him highly thought of at the club England under 19's goalkeeper which is good and some started good started out as an outfielder <laughs> yeah but it's, it's mad how crazy that actually is for a lot of players they always start in one position and, and end up being a professional in another um but some good performances out there as well. I thought Caelan Boyd Muntz is a player who's growing in stature at that 23s. Joe Redmond and Geraldo Bajrami uh, with Nico Gordon and Ryan Burke is as solid as back four as you'll find at that level. So, yeah, they have reason to, to be optimistic for the 23s. They're always challenging at the top of the Professional Development League. And hopefully, as they did last season, they can be challenging at the top again. Blues women, uh, unlucky last Sunday. 2-0 down the first half to Arsenal. Much better second half showing, but just can overturn that deficit. But January, a chance to strengthen. Already one new face as we speak through the door, Emma Kelly, uh, who's been playing in Iceland. So hopefully the rise continues. <coughs> yeah, there's been lots of changes out there to that the Blues women's side. You look back to the summer where there's lots of ins and outs. and It's going to take them time to settle in as well. You know, you hopefully see more faces this month just to help the girls and pick up some results to get them up the table. But Arsenal, we know, are always going to be a tough game. Um, you know, whenever we come up against your Chelsea's, your Man City's, your Arsenal's, um, you'll be happy to take anything from them. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. But as you say, with the addition of one or two new signers this month, they can pick up some points and get them away from danger. Well, so we got time for for this week. Um, hopefully, back in a fortnight. Yeah. Who? Well, so all calm down. A Luton. Bit now. Luton on Saturday. Big away day. We haven't been there for a few years. Massive. Time to look forward to that one. In Old fashioned now, ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cardiff City at home. Yep. Yeah, so they've had a little bit of a wobble. They're not, you know, Neil Harris at the helm now, so big changes from when Warnock was in charge. So perhaps good timing to play them. And then next time we're back, we're leading into an FA Cup fourth round tie against either <laughs> Coventry City or uh, Bristol Rovers. There we go. So yeah, I think we'll have a lot to talk about if yeah, one so do team I. wins the replay there. Absolutely. Anyway, until then, I've been Callum Denning. And I've been Dale Moon. And this has been Blues Talk. The Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning.